The Crystal Tower by Thomas Baldwin A squat grey building of only 34 storeys was not what Kira had had in mind when her father had distributed the districts among her and her brothers, but it would do for now. She was not planning on being there long anyway. Her private quarters took up the top three floors. The previous occupant had had a thing for brutalism, but all the plain white walls and angular furniture was too ascetic for her. She selected the French Rococo setting and watched as tapestries rolled down the walls and the right-angled chairs coiled into ornately carved chaise longue. On her first night, she lined up all her sector managers under the age of 50, selected the best-looking one, and took him to bed. His name was Galland something. The scars on his back were old, which meant he wielded the whip now. They drank perfect reproduction champagne and had sex on a replica of Louis XV's bed. Afterwards, she led him up the spiral staircase into her observatory on the roof. She could have set the 16 glass walls to show any scene at all, but she liked to look out on the reality. Hundreds of miles of conveyor belts and gantries crisscrossing each other web-like across mines hundreds of feet deep. The miners like termites, chimneys throwing up gouts of smoke which dyed the sky sunset red all day. Beautiful, isn't it? she said. All that activity? But it could be even better. Your father hasn't complained, he murmured. The old man's losing his touch. The shareholders will put him out of his misery soon enough. Is that why you and your brothers have all been given districts? She pointed. Alak to the east, Gethlum to the southeast, Zondalar to the south, Bethel to the west. All in bigger palaces than this one. Does that bother you? She drained her champagne glass and tried to refill it, but the bottle was empty. She tossed it into the corner, where it landed with a disappointing thud. It means I'm expected to fail. She looked out over the Hadean landscape. But if I can make a success of this place, the shareholders will put me in charge of the whole company. Most of the first two floors of the palace consisted of a reception hall with a balcony round three sides. She toyed with conference centre, but eventually decided 19th century theatre was more impressive, complete with three-tier crystal chandelier, red velvet curtains and intricate gilded decoration. 750 chairs filled with managers and workforce representatives from every sector faced a stage on which Kira sat with half a dozen senior executives and a large, nervous-looking man in a blue boiler suit. She stood and approached the dais. As she opened her mouth, she knew her voice would be crackling through the mine shafts and ringing out across factory floors, loud enough to be heard over the district's machinery. She said she would make the district a place to be proud of, and that everyone who worked hard would share in its success. She promised rewards for the most productive individuals and departments, money, fresh food, better quarters, pardons for family members in prison. And now, she said, it gives me great pleasure to present my first Worker of the Week award to Siren, a miner from Sector 73 who has broken all output records this week. She beckoned and Siren stood up and approached her. He was sweating and clutched his cap in both hands. He had made an effort to clean himself, but there was still red dust under his fingernails. Siren, you are a perfect example of the dedication we need in this district. I'm delighted to present you with this certificate, and as promised, you'll find an extra thousand credits in your account this week. 
She held out her hand and he shook it as applause rippled round the room. He made to pull back but she held on to him. I also have a surprise. I'm told you and your wife have had the maximum number of children, but they've all died. You were on the waiting list for another slot, but as we all know that is a long list. Well, today I'm delighted to announce that we've moved you up the queue and granted you reproductive rights for another child. The applause swelled. Siren cried. She asked them to pick a sector they knew was doing well for a surprise inspection. I don't want anything ugly to happen, but I need them to know that I can appear anywhere, she said. She refused a mask at first, but one breath of the unfiltered air outside the palace drove her back in, coughing violently and gasping for breath. How could people live like this? she asked as they went back out again, her face covered. I guess you must have adapted to cope. No one said anything. She walked down the wide steps outside the palace's grand entrance, past the line of soldiers, and into the waiting hovercar, glancing back at the two-storey high image of her face above the main door. As the vehicle set off, it passed a large area of dirty grass and stunted trees. A few off-duty families were sitting with picnics. What's this area called? Kira asked. Her senior assistant, a woman a little, old, little older than she, called Pala, glanced over. It's just the field. People use it for recreation. Kira drummed her fingers on the car door. I think we should have some sort of monument there, she said. A big tower, marking the rebirth of the district. Pala looked apprehensive. That may be unpopular. It's the only open area available to most families in the central sector. Kira ignored her. I want detailed plans by next week and the ground broken the week after that. The road dropped into the private tunnel network for executives and it went dark outside, except for brief glimpses of more industrial vistas, vats of molten metal and men striking up sparks with massive hammers. The car stopped at a sector administrative office. As Kira stepped out, the manager burst through the door, hurriedly straightening her cap. Madam President, she spluttered. I'm Fidelin, we're honoured. Yes, you are, she said. This is an inspection. Show me around. The sector was spotless and working smoothly. Everyone she spoke to seemed busy and happy. At the end of the tour, she shook Fidelin's hand and promised her a promotion. She pretended not to notice the poster of her face that had been half ripped off the wall. She was lounging on a chaise long, eating grapes and having her feet massaged when the vid phone rang. Hello, Kira. Her father's face leaned down at her from the big screen, dark eyes below a mane of dark hair streaked with grey. He took in the room, face twisting in his approximation of a smile. I see you've made yourself at home, he rumbled. The masseuse looked up but Kira gestured to her to continue. I earned this, she said. Have you seen my numbers? Up 8% in a fortnight. He raised a thick eyebrow. Impressive. He leaned into the screen. I've also seen your accident figures. Up 50,000 this week, 300 more deaths. She shrugged. No matter. I increased the compensation rate. It paid for itself. Anyway, since when have you cared about the little people? You can't make a profit with a broken workforce. Are you listening to me? Eight percent? Can any of the other four say that? No, actually. He sat back, spread his arms. I like what you've done with the place, by the way. He terminated the call. Nice to speak to you too, she muttered, dropping another grape into her mouth.
There were twice as many soldiers outside the palace's grand entrance as the last time she ventured out. They advised her that using the back gate might be safer, but she rejected it. Madam President! It was Siren shouting from beyond the cordon. Madam President, you remember what you said two months ago. The permission hasn't come through yet. Call the palace, she answered, not breaking stride as she and Pala climbed into the car. We've had a request from Sector 27, said Pala as they set off. They're suffering a manpower shortage and have requested any spare assets be moved to them. Do we have any spare assets? Not really. Which reminds me, the central hospitals need more money. Again? No. They're just going to have to work more efficiently. And tell Sector 27 to lower the school graduation age by two years. Get people into the workforce sooner. The field had had an access road cut across it to the centre where a tower, already 50 metres high, was sprouting surrounded by hovering work platforms and machines pumping concrete up from ground level. The crowd round the perimeter clapped dutifully as Kira got out of the car. Someone at the back shouted, Shame! But there was a brief scuffle and the man was carried off by soldiers. The leader of the monument project stepped forward and shook her hand. It was Gallen. It was the first time she had seen him since her first night. She leaned in towards him. How do you like your new job? she asked. He smiled uncertainly. I thank you for the honour, but you do know I have no experience in construction. That's what you pay other people for. How is the project going? It's a challenging timescale you've given us. We've had to cut some corners, but we're on schedule so far. Good. Keep it that way. She looked up. It's going to be magnificent. Strikes! None of the 15 senior managers round the table would meet her eye. What's going on? she demanded. There was a lot of shuffling and sidelong glances. Eventually, one of the men spoke up. You remember the accident in Sector 17 a few days ago? Ten men blinded. They were compensated, weren't they? Well, yes, but what they, the organisers, are saying is that the company, well, you, by making them work faster... Nonsense! She slapped the table. I want the troublemakers arrested. What? Another man had raised his hand. I, we, really feel if you crack down hard on this, it might cause more trouble, especially since industrial action is legal. Perhaps if you met with them, listened to their demands? No, she said. It's my brothers causing trouble. They saw how well I was doing and they're sabotaging it. Take out the ringleaders and get everyone back to work at gunpoint if necessary. She had been right. The monument was magnificent. A column 900 feet high studded with precious metals and crystals which reflected and refracted both sunlight and spotlight, throwing multicoloured beams in a spectacular and ever-changing kaleidoscopic display. She stood in the observatory watching the lights. It was especially brilliant tonight, now the sky was mostly clear. There was still some smoke from the fires that no one seemed to be attempting to put out. But the chimneys no longer smoked and the conveyor belts were still. She could dimly hear gunshots and from three floors below, dull thuds where the crowds were trying to break through her security doors. There were men at the bottom of the monument, men with pickaxes. The soldiers who should have been protecting it were among them. The tower should have been far too strong to be easily dam damaged, but as she watched, it buckled and began to topple. The men round the base scattered, some too late. The tower cracked and fell, folding in on itself, 
betraying its cheap materials and accelerated design. The lights blinked out in a cloud of dust. The thudding from below got louder. She sighed and made the call. Father, I need you to get me out of here. She heard a low rumble that might have been a laugh and then her own recorded voice. The old man's losing his touch. The shareholders will put him out of his misery soon enough. The line went silent. She swallowed and opened a channel to all the surrounding districts. Hello, can anyone hear me? Requesting an urgent airlift from the palace roof. Alak? Gethlin? Anyone? There was no answer. There was a crash as the invaders broke through another door and she could hear shouts. They were immediately below her, in her bedroom now. She paced the room in a circle, scanning the sky for a rescue flyer from any direction. Southwest, south southwest, south, southeast, east. Thank you.